and the English teacher basically pulled me aside and he said, you don't know your basic math. And she told me, you don't know how to write. I, in other words, I had to learn my math and English in junior college. That was Jesus Baragan. I'm your host, Jeff Hunt. Welcome to Storied San Francisco, a weekly podcast where San Franciscans from all walks of life share their stories, and you get to know your neighbors. In this podcast, Jesus walks us through the first half or so of his 76 years on this earth. He was born and raised in Glendale, Arizona, but moved to San Jose after his parents split up. Jesus shares difficulties he encountered in school after the move to California, and also his journey to and through college. He moved up to San Francisco in 1975 and immediately encountered discrimination at the several jobs he had here, both directed at him and systemically. He ends this episode talking about the various ways in which he fought against those prejudices. Here's Jesus. I'm born in Glendale, Arizona, and uh, I looked it up in 1950. We left around 53 for good for California, but in 1950, the town had a population of 8,500. Wow. And then when you left, 8,490. And and now today, Glendale has like over 250 or Oh, wow. Okay. Well, well, Phoenix was like a city of 200,000. Right. right. It, well, you know, I was born in Glendale, Arizona, and uh, uh, back in those days, uh, tuition, uh, my brother and I went to this uh, Catholic school, and tuition was only $5 a month per student. Not bad. And so I went from, uh, I think it was the f- first grade up to the fourth. Okay. And, you know, the Catholic school, and the way we lived over there, uh, there was a, a corner of Dobie House, uh, uh, four rooms. Uh, I think no electricity. I don't remember if it had electricity. I don't think it had running water. My grandmother rented those, and she owned that corner lot. Then there was our house. There was an aunt that lived there with her husband, uh, an aunt that lived there with her husband, and uh, who the husband knew, never worked. Uh, and uh, so the next door was grandmother, uh, a, a widowed daughter of hers, and her little girl. Next door to that was an uncle and his family. So, and then uh, about around the corner, a few yards away, was another uncle and his family. So as you can see, there was I grew up around a lot of family. Right. Uh, the way I was raised, I was raised with a lot of bigotry. Okay. Uh, if you weren't Catholic, oh, forget it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was raised not to like Jews. Mm. I was raised not to like blacks. Mm. And although I didn't know it at the time, you know, you're a kid. You don't know these things, but the main street was Glendale Avenue, and on this side, all the Mexican folk. On that side, all the white folks. You know, right? And but you don't notice that as a kid. So it it was a segregated town, right? And when you went uptown, uh, the only businesses on the Mexican side were the businesses along the street that you know, but mm-hmm. everything was on that side. Mm the main supermarket, the two theaters, the mortuary, the city hall, the post office, the bank, everything. Mm-hmm. Was your school integrated then? or? Yeah, it was uh, uh, white and Mexican folks. And, you know, the way we grew up, uh, because I consider myself a conquered person, okay. uh, that England set up their system here. And we follow that. We measure our success and everything by that standard. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we speak English. Yeah. If France had settled it, we'd be speaking French. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so what that means of a conquered people is you're using someone's standard to define you. So you're always going to be second fiddle. Right. 
until you say, hell no, no more, which is what the 60s were all about. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then my parents divorced uh, in like, I think 53 uh, or 52, something. So we came to California, bounced up and down the state, and finally settled in San Jose in in uh, 1955. Okay. And uh, I went to, I went one year to elementary school, and plus I really fell behind two different teaching systems. Right. Uh, How old were you then? At, at probably that around 10. Okay. And I remember in the sixth grade, uh, the, the multiplication tables, uh, they had not covered them in Arizona, and and I think they covered them in the f- fifth grade elementary school here. Well, I skipped the fifth grade because I remember I used to have to stay after school along with this other student to learn our times tables. Okay. Then this I is, this is in California. You yeah. Mean? Okay. And then I went to a very very rough junior high school. Okay. They had seven, eighth, and ninth grades, where the teachers didn't care. I had a teacher. This was public school in San Yeah, okay. uh-huh. and I thought, oh, these kids are wild. Yeah. Uh, you know, but um, I had a teacher who would write 20 problems in math and then uh, take attendance and go on the hall and gossip with the other teachers, mm. come back, collect the papers. I usually got them all wrong. Oh, no. But he never told me why. So they weren't really, you didn't, already at that young age, you noticed they, they didn't seem like they were really invested in. No, no. Again, the profiling, the who's going to, right. you know, who are the, who are the goody two shoes and who are the <laughs> whatever. And I would get, I would get, uh, I remember I've been sent to the principal's office and stuff. You weren't allowed to speak Spanish. If you were, mm. they overheard you. Ugh. You'd be in trouble. Mm. So then I uh, I went to the high school next door, San Jose High, and uh, I did learn to type 42 words without no errors. Uh, but again, I, I didn't have a math class in those right. three years of high school. None at all. Not at all. They put wow. me in Future Farmers of America. <laughs> okay, there's so much oh, there. Oh, hey, this, you know, that's the way things were, and... So anyway, I graduated. Can I, can I ask real fast? Did you grow up speaking Spanish and English? Yeah. Okay, both. But Spanish is my first language. Right. In the yeah. home, in the home, you spoke Spanish. Yeah. Uh-huh. And with your family, especially right. all right there. Yeah. Uh, the only time we spoke English was in school. Right. In fact, I remember playing when I was a little kid, probably in the first grade, playing with my cousins, uh, pretending we're talking English and all this <laughs> gibberish. Did you learn Latin in, in no. Catholic school? No, no, okay. no. they so didn't just... teach us that. The, at the Catholic school, the masses were in Latin. Right. We didn't know what they were saying. Uh, right. <laughs> oh, anyway, so uh, so then I graduated. I was 17. I couldn't get a job because I didn't know how to file. I didn't know that it was letter per letter. I just thought it was the first letter and that's it. Okay. So I go I go and take these tests for filing and I flunk. Mm. And uh, so uh, what what year would this have been that you graduated? I graduated in 1962. 62. I was 17. Okay. Uh, I'm October I turned 18. Okay. And I turned 18 and then I did get a job as a like a part-time salesperson where a lot of migrants came. Mm-hmm. I did that for a little while. Then I was not earning any really money there. Were you still living at, with at your home. parents? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah see, I come from a background where you don't leave home until you marry. Right. And Or you go away to college, right. which is very, very rare. Yeah. I only more, have More rare than even, right? Yeah, I have one cousin that went to Arizona State College for one year, and then they couldn't afford it no more, so, you know. Right. But uh, basically, in high school, we were not programmed to think college. Right. And uh, and I remember I in high school was my, my senior year, and I went to my counselor and I told her, I think I would like to try city college, you know, or college. And I'm thinking junior college. She told me I was not meant to go to college. I would never make it. Uh, and uh, she was white, I'm guessing. Yeah. But see, I was mad at her for a long time, but 
uh, then later in later years I I really knew what she was trying to tell me but she couldn't say those words okay. she couldn't say we didn't program you to right. go to college we didn't develop you she couldn't say those things right so anyway uh, so I I kept insisting and she put me in a, in a grade uh, English class English literature college prep all I can remember is some character named Beowulf. <laughs> I got a C out of there, but anyway. Hey, that's, that's but I bad. couldn't see back then. I couldn't afford to go to college because a junior college is there was no tuition. Right. But you had to buy your books. Well, right. I couldn't afford to buy the books. Okay. Well, it turned out that I ended up. Um, well, well, after the clothing job thing, I got a job. For a dollar and a quarter making tortillas. But I'm thinking, why did I, why, I have a high school diploma, why am I here? Hmm. But, but then after that, I got a job washing dishes, uh, busing dishes at the county hospital in the kitchen right across the street from Junior, from City College. Okay. So I said, now is my chance, and that's how I started. And that's in San Jose? In San Jose. San Jose. And then I had to... It was time to go into the military, mm-hmm. so I went and did that. I, I fought in the Vietnam War. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you enlisted? You weren't drafted? Well, or? you can only be drafted into the Army. Okay. You, the rest you join. Yeah. I, had, I didn't want to go to the Army, so I thought, well, they're going to get you. The Vietnam War is getting hot. So I joined the Navy in 1965. Okay. And I did the reserve so I could go to uh, college. Yeah. One more semester. And um, luckily at San Jose City College, a math teacher uh, and an English teacher basically pulled me aside. And he said, you don't know your basic math. And she told me, you don't know how to write. I, In other words, I had to learn my math and English in junior college. Wow. Okay. Was that true that you didn't know how to write? Huh? Or was it true that you didn't know how to write? We've talked about no. the math, but... No, because I remember doesn't... in high school, they gave us an assignment, and the teacher said to put something in italics. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what italics was, and right. I was embarrassed to ask. So I put wrote out the word italics, and then whatever, and then italics. <laughs> 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 that actually makes sense, yeah. if you don't know specifically no, what that means. I used, no, I went to a junior high school uh, that was... I remember one teacher used to leave the room and there was a back room with magazines and this young girl used to go with two guys and they stayed uh, the whole hour and then came out. Wow, it's so... They were getting it on and in junior high and in, t- in school. So irresponsible and, no, no, you know, and I lazy. Had, and, see, uh, yeah. and again, uh, profile. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so wait, so were you already uh, enrolled at San Jose City College when you joined the Navy, or which yeah. which happened first? Yeah, uh, you, I you was at in. City College first. Okay. And I didn't know what I didn't know what I wanted. Right. So I took oh, I even took hairdressing for two semesters. Like a friend talked me into it. That could come in handy now when everyone needs a haircut. Well, I know how to work on my hair, but, you know, I mean, my, my hair is very fine and thin. Yeah, it looks really – are you, are you cutting it during pandemic? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to my hair – the guy that cuts my hair lives in Fremont. Okay. So I take Bart to call us, see him. A friend picks me up, and we drive to his house. There you go. Okay, and, but getting back to yeah. – you were taking a lot of classes, a lot of different Yeah, just things. a lot of classes. I didn't know what I wanted. That's so, a good so, way to find out, though. Yeah. Young Jesus. That's uh-huh. a, right. <laughs> you try this, try and that. And in 1972, I took a class, the, black, the psychology of adjustment from the black perspective. Okay. And all these light bulbs start going off in my head. Like, I, I knew then what she was talking about. See, I always knew there was something wrong out there, but I wasn't sure exactly how it all fit Mm -hmm. and she kind of explained it so that's when i said psychology that's my calling Hmm, okay yeah because by 1972 that's almost the the Mm -hmm. tail end of civil rights yeah almost yeah and but see first i had to find out who i was right so i took a lot of uh i took a lot of um you know uh 
I th- I use the word Chicano classes, but you know, it could be Mexican American or sure. So anyway, uh, uh, so 1972. So you f- I you took, took a lot of those classes. I say that I got my start in 1973. You know, kind of activism. Okay. Uh, and I started with the uh, Chicano movement. Right. And I knew that that there was something inconsistencies in the theory. Like especially when we used to go uh, picket mm-hmm. uh, Safeway, mm-hmm. and you see you see some Latinos and whites, and then you see some Latinos, blacks, uh, whites coming out of the store, and mm-hmm. so I'm saying uh, to myself, uh, something's not right because. In the Chicano movement back in those days, you know, whites were the cause of all our problems. Mm-hmm. And uh, and being gay, you know, I'm over there in the bars and most are white. So I better better there's something not right here. Mm-hmm. So there's something not right. So anyway, from the Chicano movement, are you ready for this? Absolutely. I joined the Communist Party. Okay. In 1975. Because, see, I was selected to go to a university in Moscow, which would have not counted at all here Right. Uh, back then. So we went to the post office to, uh, you know, my student visa. Well, they never would let me out of the country. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I never went. And uh, there was a school in East L.A. that examined the relationship of the Chicano Liberation Movement to Marxist-Leninist theory okay. connection. And that's where I met, uh, met Angela Davis. Okay, She autographed her book, which is, I have it on the shelf. So I went to that school and everything. Is that, I'm sorry, is that what drew you to join the Communist Party or? Yes. That, okay, that, yes. Made, that made the connection yeah. for you, okay. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that the school was sponsored by the Communist Party. Oh, wow. And uh, <laughs> I rode with two guys uh, who in a beat up Volkswagen who were going also to that school. I, I just met him that morning. Mm-hmm. No, one of them I hadn't met before. The other guy I just met that morning. And we're going down in State 5, and one of them says, yeah, I joined the Communist Party. So, so you know, again, that instinct, uh, that word that causes people to shake in their shoes. Right. I almost said, stop the car, let me out. <laughs> and <laughs> right. so I'm going down there. It was a shock for it you. It was a shock was, for yeah, me. Yeah. I, and I'm down there, and I'm basically seeing everything through these eyes. It's kind of like all I know. Yeah. And um, I, they almost asked me to leave the school because some wow. of the other students complained. But I said, well, wait a minute uh, before I decide. Let me." So I called the woman that had... Uh, mentioned the school because she said this will be good for you since you're going to go to school in Moscow you kind of have a sense of how they think okay and I called her and I said why didn't you tell me that this was all communist party and she said because like most people I thought you would run away Mm. so I said "Uh uh-huh and then after talking to her I knew what I had to do I basically had to wipe out everything and go in there with a clear mind. You had to destigmatize communism. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. So right. I went in and I graduated with flying colors. It's like you found a calling, huh? You know, after being told you can't do math and write well, and yeah, all this other uh-huh. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that had happened at uh, college. Uh, actually, I had graduated from San Jose State already in '75. Okay. And by that time, I knew I wanted to move to San Francisco. Okay. Can we? Yeah, I can we knew really it already. get into that? What? Had you visited San Francisco? Already? Oh yeah, I was coming yeah. up on weekends. Let's talk about if you can remember. Let's talk about your first ever time to be in San Francisco. And what you know? What did you do? What did you think? Well, I mean, we only came up here to go to the bathhouses. <laughs> right. <laughs> That'll tell you. Uh, okay. And then I had another friend who he had discovered the Castro, mm-hmm. a Castro Street Fair and all that. So this is still the 70s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we would come up and everything. And uh, that's what caused me to want to live up here because I didn't know that neighborhood existed. Right. So uh, I, I, I came and apply. I started applying for jobs up here. Okay. 
once I graduated from college, mm-hmm. the funniest thing happened. I got a job. It was a CETA job with the San Francisco Civil Service Commission. Okay. That's unheard of. Right. But see, there there was this women, two women, Latinas. Uh, one worked for the mayor's office of employment and training. The other one, civil service, as a recruiter. Okay. And uh, they were rocking the boat because, see, back in those days, uh, the city was getting all these federal funds from the office of revenue sharing for employment. Okay. Well. I, I remember the Latino population in San Francisco was like 12%, okay. but they only had two point something on their workforce. Right. So these two women f- ended up forming Latinos for Affirmative Action. And uh, because she had recruited me, I was blackballed from the beginning. Mm. Uh, only one person really became my friend. Uh, the other ones were kind of nice, talked to me. But... You have a person fresh out of college, no experience. It's a training. The first day they plopped, they plopped a stack of books like that high. They put about eight or ten books in front of my, on my desk. And they gave me this uh, sheet of paper and said, uh, start writing an exam. It was a promotional exam for the police department. Okay. My first assignment, you don't do that to a CD. <laughs> Right. My supervisor was so overworked, overwhelmed, behind. He w- he wasn't, and nothing. And it's like the woman who recruited me told me they they're going to keep you ignorant. Mm. And uh, and I was actually like, I was actually the mole because uh, she left to go work somewhere else, and uh, she s- said. Uh, Get a hold of the uh, of the city's salary standardization ordinance, and there is such a book that exists to this day. Okay. So I snuck it out. <laughs> a couple of <laughs> days later, uh, one of the men, one of the managers, comes, uh, kind of like asking me for it. And oh, uh, I'll, okay, let me in a minute. I called her up and I said, "Guess what?" And da, da, da. So I, I took the bus to I think it's uh, Sixth Street or. Six or seven or seven Street, where she works, where she was working, got it back, brought it back to the office, snuck it in, and then uh, later on told that guy, "Here, here it is." But they <laughs> see, they knew I was information was leaking out, and one day I came back from lunch and said, "Clear out your desk immediately and report to Muni." Muni, okay. Yeah. See, back then, I had, uh, not me really, but uh, the woman that recruited me, she had the political oomph. Like one day, uh, that manager wanted to meet with me in the office, mm-hmm. one-to-one, and I thought something's going up. So I called my friend. She called, uh, she called uh, uh, Vince Courtney, who was president of SEIU, okay. and he shows up at that meeting. To be there for stunned you. Yeah. the manager, wow. stunned the manager. Yeah. So they couldn't fire me. Uh, anyway, uh, I was the main plaintiff when they filed a complaint against the Office of Revenue Sharing. Oh. San Francisco was investigated. They were found uh, uh, in noncompliance. Feinstein, who was mayor, they plopped it on her desk, and she had a choice. You don't sign, but you have to return all that money mm. that you've gotten. San Francisco would have, gone, would have had to file for bankruptcy. Jeez. It was, so the, two, it was 240-something million, and this is in the 70s. 70s, yeah, that's even... Uh, and then, uh, so... Uh, that was a federal... They were sued by the federal government? Y- well, not sued, complaint. Or, okay. We, we, you have to go through a process. Right. So, uh, so Feinstein wow. signed. She, she didn't have the money. Uh, she actually honored us at a presentation, called the board up and everything later on, mm-hmm. playing her politics. Sure. And uh, my friend, she, she had some oomph because I remember we went to a fundraiser to Nancy Pelosi's house. Mm-hmm. Way back then, uh, she was a fundraiser for the Democratic Party before she got say, entered politics. Not yet a rep. Yeah, her right. her husband was the politician. Right. So we went, and you know, 
was a rub. Elbows were yeah. there. I could care less. So anyway. <laughs> good, or, good hors d'oeuvres, maybe. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> then after, after the city, I, I, I got fed up one day at Muni, and I just hand-wrote a, res- a resignation at 5 p.m. I'm, I'm gone. What was your job at Muni? Uh, assistant personnel analyst. Okay, and what year would that have been? Uh, that was in uh, 78. So you had already moved here. Can we talk? Can we go back just a little bit to talk about your decision to move up here? Yeah. Well, that job made it possible. Okay. Because there's no way I was going to move up here without a job. Right. You know, and I had you. I had met this uh, guy where uh, we had a little thing, you know. But uh, we used uh, the way we set it up. I used. He said I could use his address and his phone number. He had a an ex lover who lived down in the basement. Uh, Good place who, to who keep ex lovers. Who was there all day? So, so you know, if somebody called, he would call. Uh, uh, his name was Sydney. He was a city planner. Mm-hmm. Then Sydney would call me in San Jose, and and then I would call whoever back. Oh. So that's how I ended up moving up here. And is this apartment the first place no, you no. moved? No, uh, no. I moved into the Leland Hotel. Leland Hotel. This is an old friend who lived in San Jose who was there. It's on Polk and Sutter, right in the corner. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. Okay. But back then it was wild. Uh, yeah. Polk Street was Polk Street back then. Yeah. He worked at night, and I worked day, so we really never saw each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, the fire alarm would go <laughs> in the middle of the night, and uh, you know you sounds lively. So I, I only lived there for a month, and then I I had already joined the party, you know, when I before I moved up here, and I went to a meeting, a community meeting, and there's this uh, elderly lady, she's like 61, and she just started talking to her, and then she asked me, she just asked me. If I would uh, a home sit for a for a month, uh, th- she'd already paid the rent for the coming month to feed her cat and water the plants. So okay. I said sure, and this was on Seventeenth and uh, Douglas, up in the Castro. Yeah, and I lived there for seven months. Okay. Then I moved to a uh, cottage on Dubose near a uh, church. Okay. Uh huh. And uh, there was a black church next door. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I lived there for about eight months, and then I moved here. In nineteen seventy-seven. Wow. Okay. And um, it's interesting because in San Francisco, all of my jobs have had a political connection. I was gonna. Yes. Yeah, I uh, I was denied a promotion, the directorship of uh, I worked for the VA, mm-hmm. these vet centers, mm-hmm. who uh, did. PTSD counseling for the Vietnam vets. Mm-hmm. Um, I was acting director for a year, and I was set to get it permanent. But the guy that that was our regional manager, he quit mm. and went to work somewhere else. And these, and then the second in command in D.C. had it out for me for being gay. Okay. And uh, in fact. Uh, when he found out, he called San Francisco, and uh, the director told me that that guy called and asked him, what the hell are you doing uh, hiring gay people? Yeah. So uh, anyway, so uh, anyway, that program eventually acknowledged gay vets because I was on the faculty for gay vets. How much later did that happen after what you're talking about? Well, let's about? see. I started in 81, November, probably by 84. Oh, okay. Because we had a group, of gay vets. Okay. And uh, I was I was the only guy in a group of uh, uh, women. They were the uh, uh, partners or wives of vets, mm-hmm. and uh, we had a we contracted a female. Uh, we contracted a female therapist mm-hmm. as my co-facilitator, but I was the only guy, and I thought guys cussed. <laughs> ooh, those women! Ooh, they I mean, even would laugh at me and said, "Look at Jesus, he's red as a beet." <laughs> oh, the things they would say. Ooh. That was Jesus Baragan. 
Join us Thursday for part two, when Jesus will share how he came to work at City Hall. Music for Storied San Francisco is by Otis McDonald. Photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. The show is hosted and produced by me. Michelle and I have produced more than 120 episodes over the last three years, and you can find them all over at our website, storiedsf.com. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, as well as just about everywhere you can listen to podcasts. Please subscribe to stay up to date on all the content we publish. And if you have any feedback for us, or you just want to say hi, our email is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay strong, stay safe, and stay healthy. Thank you.